And this is going to be slightly informal. You will see in the aisle two microphones. You will be able to go up, make a short statement if you like, or ask some questions. Joining Mr. Martinez is Jose Lorenzo, and they will do their own self-introductions. Also in the room are two other, three other subject matter experts. Our Kentucky Division Director, Linda Goodman, our Director of, is the Deputy Director of Enforcement, Bill Mulharney, and our Director of Governmental Affairs, Wally Day. So I'm going to turn this over to and he will take it from here. Again, he said it's going to be slightly informal. We think that will be good for everyone in attendance. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ray Martinez. Uh, I am the uh, administrator of the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Commission. Uh, I've been on the job about four weeks, uh, and this is my first match. A great opportunity for me to actually meet the uh, people in the industry that are uh, so important to us. And when I say us, I mean uh, to, to America, to the United States, to our economy, uh, and everything that you do. Uh, we've been trying to do some outreach, uh, not just to uh, put information out there, clear up uh, areas where there might be confusion in any of our regulations, any of our enforcement areas. Um, but also, we wanted the time to, you know, just open it up and listen and take suggestions. Uh, we think it hopefully would be, you know, constructive uh, suggestions, uh, maybe inform me because I am new on the job, uh, as to uh, what, we, what you think some of the challenges are out there that uh, where we might be able to, to uh, help, okay? Um, I know that some of you hopefully have participated in uh, the uh, sessions that we did on ELDs that Joe uh, uh, was uh, chairing. We've done two so far. And uh, there's another session tomorrow um, on uh, hours of service, uh, which is in room 104. So we hope that you'll join us then. Uh, what I've told my folks uh, in the FMCSA, the organization that I uh, that I just joined is uh, I come, I'm a regulator. I came from uh, being Motor Vehicle Commissioner in the state of New York and Motor Vehicle Commissioner in, uh, in New Jersey. Uh, and so I'm used to not being the most uh, a favorite person in a room. Uh, you know, people don't send me flowers and balloons uh, every day. Uh, but I, in both of those jobs, I try to maintain a really good working relationship. Uh, particularly with uh, the trucking associations in our state and the people that actually uh, work and try and bring common sense uh, to some of the things that we did. Uh, and that doesn't mean that everybody was always happy with dealing with the motor vehicle department, but I believe that in both of those states, we uh, improved operations, we tried to be more customer friendly, uh, and, um, and, and tried to bring some common sense to, to the operation. And that's the same approach that I wanted to do here. The FMCSA, established by Congress, uh, is a safety organization, and we, we never forget it because it's in our title, it's in our name, it's in our, every piece of stationery in our office. We're about safety. And I say safety is our priority, but I keep reminding everyone that it's not a monopoly. We don't have a monopoly on safety. We know that there's great operators out there, owners, fleet managers, that make it a priority as well. Uh, the goal is really to have that safety as a priority, but also not impede economy, okay? Not improve. We're all hoping, everybody in this room is hoping that, that we have better, that the economy of the country improves. I think that's what the president <coughs> wants to see. I know that's what the president wants to see and what Secretary Chow wants to see. Um, so we have to keep moving, increasing safety, but also doing it in a way that doesn't impede uh, your critical role in the economy. For those of you who don't know a lot about the FMCSA, because sometimes you know they look they look at our agency that maybe we're uh, you know uh, in a negative way. We only are an agency of about 1,100 people okay, that cover the entire country. Most of the people are out in the field. We have offices in every state, um, and as you know, 
you usually won't interface directly with the FMCSA, at least in an enforcement environment. It's usually with our state partners, uh, State Patrol or, or uh, you know, some of our other partners in the state. Um, but, uh, and that's one of our primary roles is to provide grants to our states, to uh, our, our, our state partners. Now, what you say, why, what is the role uh, here? Well, look, the truth is that uh, we have seen a marked increase in the use uh, of, um, uh, of crashes involving uh, large trucks and buses. In 2016, there were 4,317 fatalities in crashes involving large trucks and buses, which is a 5.4% increase from 2015. Now, 72% uh, of those killed in large uh, truck crashes in 2016 were occupants of the passenger vehicles, not the trucks. That's not a commentary on the trucks being the cause of the crash, okay? That's just physics. That's the way it works. I don't have to tell you that. Uh, but it, it's because, uh, it's a lot of reasons, the main, a lot of reason is because people don't know how to interact with, uh, with large vehicles on the roadways. Uh, and that's an education piece that we're going to remain uh, focused on. Um, I'm, I've been charged by the President and by the Secretary to look at the regulations that we currently have in place from top to bottom and say what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Okay, I can't do that. I can't change law. I'm not Congress. I may be able to make changes to regulation if they're outdated, if they don't make sense. Um, and, uh, but the only way we do that is by listening, okay? And, and learning. And but that is my priority. Um, I've had the opportunity in a couple of weeks that I've been on the job to meet with uh, 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 the uh, OIDA and with the ATA, uh, but this is my first opportunity to actually uh, you know, do a more grassroots uh, outreach and hear from, from people. What I'm hoping that we can do uh, over the time, because I'm just going to end my remarks, this is the rest of my remarks, I'll be doing that. Um, what I'd like to hear is constructive. This, if there's criticisms, this is not a, uh, you know, shouldn't be an angry event. Uh, you, you've got a tough job to do, and we have our own job to do. And more often than not, we're going to agree, I think. Uh, but uh, if you've got constructive ideas on things where, that we should be looking at, uh, that would make, not compromise safety, but, uh, you know, uh, make it easier for you to do your jobs. That's, that's what I want to hear. We're here to take, we're taking notes. We've got some experts uh, that can answer questions if you have any. And, uh, and that's how I'd like to proceed. Now, uh, Joe, do you have anything you want to talk with? Or is your voice slow? Uh, it's it's not all that, no, I'm good. Okay, uh, with that, that's, the floor is yours. Uh, what I would ask is, uh, uh, it's a small enough, enough room. You can ask the question, sir, right on, on the aisle. <laughs> if you could speak up just so everybody can hear the question. Chain that aren't your fault. 
you know, if you're stuck waiting uh, to load for two or three hours, well, guess what? Uh, that's not good for you. If somebody's picking your pocket, I'm sorry to tell you. And that's not good for safety. Yeah. And I don't want to pit one end of the industry against the other. But that also goes back to what I just said about the economy. Because you're so critical, and this industry is so critical to, critical to the economy, we can't have that type of inefficiency in the system. Okay? So if ELDs helps to spotlight that there's an inequity here, that's if there's a problem here, well, maybe we can use it to our advantage. But, Charles, I don't know if you want to. Well, I actually have a question to come back with because, so, I mean, they answered the question, right? We, I think we all know we're not going to go backwards. You know, the Congress passed a law that's like we do ELD, so that's kind of where we're going to go. But you're, what I'm hearing, to kind of to the administrator's point, is you're saying, so there's a problem with the hours of service because of my shippers and detention time. My question is, so what's the suggestion? You know, like, you know, if there's an issue, and if talk, some of us have talked about this over the last couple of days, kind of what are you saying would be helpful in the sense of kind of, of adjusting, you know, the hours of service? If we start with the premise that, okay, ELDs didn't change the hours of service, but there are some inefficiencies built into the system, as, uh, as the administrator said, and that's causing us problems with hours of service. So if you were gonna sit down and write it today, Stop you know. The, the radio 14 hour clock. The 14 hour rule that you guys enacted ruined everything for us. It has nothing to do with the ELD. I've got a lot of friends that have. Hey, <laughs> somebody else you know your, your favoritism everybody we've already proved all these laws work the old ten and eight worked and as far as your 26 people being killed you put a breathalyzer in every car that's 10,000 lives you just saved amen you know it's amen you guys don't listen to us ATA does not represent us no they don't right. okay and I'm not again I'm not here to pit no I'm just going to say you've got I've had the opportunity we to, just want somebody to and, listen and, and by the way there's there's you know I happen to be a strong proponent of uh, 
uh, you, you know, you mentioned, uh, I've met with OIDA, I've met with the ATA, you guys, that's part of it. But, 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 I'm a strong proponent of, of associations and organizations because we know that they amplify the voice of, of whoever, and I'm not just talking about in this industry, uh, I can't talk to every truck driver or truck owner no. in the country. But, uh, so I am a proponent of associations. But this is the type of situation where we will be going around the country just like this. So listen, not just on, on this issue, but on other issues going for as long as I'm okay? I've got a pretty thick skin, as I, as I said. Uh, sorry, I want to go back to maybe some of the issues, and you know, we can use some of these, the talking points as uh, we're throwing out some issues. Right. This is not formal proposals by, by, um, by the FMCSA, because that is a legally, once we start pro proposing stuff, there's a whole process we have to go through. It takes years, and then hopefully what comes out is what we intend, because sometimes it isn't, okay, uh, in the regulatory process. But right now, it's just us talking, right. and so we can talk about things like, well, what's your really want to talk about? Well, I mean, I, I think the thing you were bringing up, and I just came out of the ELD session, and we had a long conversation in the hallway, a bunch of us about publicity. You know, and I think to your point, I, I do want to kind of clarify one thing, is that, you know, a lot of those exemptions that are in the ranks, most of them are statutory. Right. Okay, so we are the implementers, as the minister said, and we try to wrestle. But I do think that, you know, we've heard some different thoughts and kind of hearing you know, you're bringing up a 24-hour restart versus something else, yes. or, you know, the split sleeper thing. Those are the kind of things I think that are kind of important um, for us because, it, you know, I, it is interesting because, and I think we all know why, but, you know, the 14-hour rule went away in 2005. There's clearly a lot of frustration about it, but really, we haven't heard that much about it until the last year or two. So I think that the fact that we're having this discussion is, is good because it, it's needed to be had for a really long time. There's a, this guy over here has been waiting for a really long time. He, he was like the first point. I think this 14 hour
rush hour traffic, you know, wait till that's gone, start back up again. It made a huge difference. My guys are tired. Um, I know the electronic logs aren't going to go away, but they're feeling rushed. Um, you know, parking is a huge issue, especially in New York. Nobody wants trucks up there. My drivers are stopping their trips sooner to make sure they get parking. Either that or I'm reserving parking. 1450 to 1850 to park a truck. It's crazy. They can't park on ramps. It's not safe. Um, you know, it's crazy. And it's not like they're not replanning their trips, but coming from New York, you know what the trip is like? My truck's ringing out in New Jersey. They're stopping accidents. You know, I'm up constantly now. Okay, can they stop here, here, but they're, what we're doing is we're stopping them ahead of time to make sure, you know, even if they're 15 minutes from getting to the nearest truck stop, say they don't take a phone bill, they can't do it. And if they can just make it, they better be um, paying for the parking or they're not going to have a spot to park. So that parking is huge. Um, but I really think they, they need to be able to stop this clock and we need to go backwards. Um, and give the drivers time to stop, take a nap, get some sleep, wait till the traffic dies down. That would make the roads much, much safer. And one other thing before I sit down, um, shippers. Shippers need to get on the bandwagon. For instance, two weeks ago, my truck was a Coca-Cola up in Vermont, or not Vermont, but New Hampshire. And I called the broker, and I called Coca-Cola several times to make sure if my driver sat for more than two hours, or past his time that he would have a safe haven to park right there. Nobody could give us an answer. The broker couldn't give us an answer. Coca-Cola couldn't answer their phone. My driver sat for six hours and was told to leave. What are they supposed to do? Luckily, he found a place to park just down the road, went on personal conveyance, but these shippers need to be made aware. They need to be paid attention after two hours, and not just $25 an hour. That is ridiculous. So, there. Uh, I'll start right with the first piece on the driver education. And this is something that I've you know, had to deal with uh, closely as a commissioner in, in both states, in both New York and New Jersey. And it's, it's a constant battle because we're not just talking, you're talking about training of drivers that are not even, not even CDL. We all know how that has become more challenging, uh, even in the time when we have a, a driver shortage of that. Uh, but I hear from both sides of the spectrum. So, I'm hearing, you know, we really need, we need more drivers, we need better trained drivers before they get behind the wheel uh, in the CDL world. But for basic drivers, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we don't, and again, some states do it better than others, but in most states, it's, you know, they don't have to get any training anymore. And they just go, they get lucky, get their, go through their test, which by the way, if motor vehicles is given the test, it's a very, very rudimentary test. And then they're out there and they, don't, they really don't have a, any concept of what do you do, how do you interact with a large truck or bus. Um, much, much less, we've all seen it, the best, the most responsible uh, drivers on the roadways are the folks in your industry, I know that for a fact. And you see the bad behavior that goes on, and nobody knows it better than uh, the folks in this industry, when you see that people are literally reading from texting and driving and doing everything but focusing on the road. Uh, there. So I think that, you know, I think states are now looking uh, at uh, their enforcement efforts uh, and maybe education as well. I think graduated driver license uh, in, in many states has been an improvement uh, and, you know, where they're on, you know, probation for a while before they get their that full license. Mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully that will improve. The parking issue I've heard and we've addressed, uh, I think, again, on the state level, I think the feds from our agency, we will continue to work with our state partners on that issue because I know it's not going away. On the detention issue, um, I'm going to tell you that uh, people may not like to hear this, but I think the DLDs actually are going to help you in this area because that cannot be sustained. All right, that shows a glaring inefficiency in the economy, and they are picking your pockets by doing that. And in doing so, they're also making the roads unsafe. But why are so, the truck drivers having to be punished for what the shippers and receivers are doing? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm with it. But I'm, I, you know, this is this is one of those situations where the economy is going to it will fix itself here. Um, 
But at first, there's got to be an understanding of exactly what's happening. And once, once we have that data and it's clear to everybody, uh, it will get rectified. Um, and whether, whether it's by, by government action or by the market. Okay? Um, okay? There was one other piece on that. What was the last uh, uh, I want to just add something to what you were just saying, though, if I could, and then on the outreach. Um, something that we did that happened hand in hand with the ELD rule that a lot of people aren't talking about and probably not talking about enough that the administrator just referenced is the responsibility of the shipper. On the same day that the ELD rule was published, we published another rule that for the first time gave us some enforcement authority over a shipper that causes an hours of service violation or some other violation of the rights. I will tell you from my perspective and what kind of I could do to help and what we could do to help, we have, I know it's happening because I hear it from you guys all the time, but we have had very little kind of action in that area, so to speak. And, you know, the education part of it is certainly helpful and the, um, you know, kind of trying to, you know, work the inefficiencies out. But at some point in time, I want to hear from you guys, you need to hold them responsible. To your point, why are you putting this on me? So I think kind of as a group, we need to get together and figure out, you know, within the bounds of the existing kind of regulatory scheme, what we have now, rather than creating anything new or doing whatever. I, just from my perspective, I don't think that we've done enough in that area, and it's something that maybe from my point of view, I need to do some more work on making sure people know how that works, how it should work, and what we can do for you if you get caught in those kind of scenarios, because there is some stuff that we can do to help, but everybody's been really focused on like ELD and trying to deal with ELD and ELD implementation, that maybe we haven't focused enough on the implementation of that authority, and that's exactly why we did those two so what is that? How do you help in that situation? The shipper holds us until we're, you know, to our 13 and a half hours, and we've right. got three hours to find parking. We can't stay there. They haul our truck off their property. Right. How, what do you do so about it? So there's nothing I can do about it right at that point in time, but if we find out about it, if, if, and, and if they have, you know, violated that part of the regulations, which from what it sounds like you said, again, we have the authority as an agency to address it. Okay, How? Where's the, what's the chief? What are so, you going to do? I mean, I mean, it's the same thing that would happen to anybody. I mean, we can go after them investigatively and find them for that. And, you know, all the list of penalties that come along and with it. And see if there's a, a pattern. Because if there's a pattern of abuse, they're picking your pocket. I mean, I don't have another way to How do we get it. a hold of you guys? I thought he was going to give out my email. <laughs> <laughs> But your I email. Will, I mean, and what's one of the things that we can work through? I mean, to his, to his point, one of the on this on this particular issue, uh, like if you were going to file a complaint, if you go to our website, there is a link to the complaint database. You can do it all online, or you can call the number, whatever makes you happy, and we get that complaint. And now we're connected, and so in our work at headquarters, what we do is we kind of kind of bridge those things out to the field staff that. Administrator reference and we investigate those complaints to try and address them. So that's that's kind of how the process works. We have to have some way to intake it, make sure it has what we need to move forward, and then we move forward. Because you know we just need to sort that out. Yes, sir. Yeah. One of the things I want to say is since public transportation, everybody, cars, trucks, you know, everybody, we all share the same roads. Why why are we all share the same laws? We have to have an ELD. Four wheels, motorcycles, cops, fire departments, ambulance, everybody should have to have one instead of them driving clear across the country with no regulations and then they're causing us accidents. Number two, why can't they make the left lane a truck only lane? Because we're oh, only man. going across country, Amen. we're trying to get through and we're not getting on and off like the cars. So they prevent us from being in the left lane. But we should be in the left lane, right. and all the other cars should be, in the, you know, going to be getting off from five miles down the road, be in the slower lanes because they're getting off. You know, make a truck only lane, and we can get on down the road. That will help. Right. Amen. Amen. Uh, Amen. Uh, uh, maybe in the back.
actor, Sharon, the gentleman in the back? Or, uh, the gentleman. Oh, okay. That's right. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming down and uh, thanks for lying to me. My name is Bob Esler. I've been in this business since 1968. When I first started trucking, we had a lot of two lane road. We didn't have a lot of interstate. When Ann Farrell, the predecessor, was around, I wrote a letter to her that said, Beat the clock. But when the ELDs was implemented, the old game show beat the clock, that's what we're trying to do now. It's a culture thing. We're being pressured now. We know that we're pointing, we've got so much to do. We've got this gadget on the dash. Yeah, 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 yeah. mm -hmm. so uh, so the screen. It won't let them share. The machine. <laughs> There's been a proposal sent to folks I'll from Hawaii to extend the hours of service for three hours for a rest period and not count against the 70 or not increase the 70 to 80 but to extend the day for a rest period. And then after that, you take your 10 hours off before you can drive again. I want to know if you folks have ever had thought about addressing that issue. Uh, number uh, two, uh, mandatory inter-level driver training. We've been pushing for mandatory inter-level driver training since the beginning of the time, since the line has started. Why, why, why can't we have mandatory inter-level driver training? What's the hold up on it? I know Congress drags your feet, but you guys can make a rule, propose a rule, and it goes to a rulemaking procedure. I'm sure this bunch in here would love to see mandatory level driver train. Because when I started with seeing my pants. You know, that's how I learned how to drive. But you got, I had, I worked part time as a driver, uh, evaluator, trainer for a matter of nothing. And my, or my job is to teach people how to load and unload a pneumatic trailer. They hired a guy. He said, I said, I just want to drive at 13-speed. I did it on YouTube. No sense. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, first of all, a comment on the, on the uh, pending sub, uh, submission that was already <coughs> Uh, put forward by Hawaii. Uh, it is, you know, kind of a formal process. We don't have a response yet, but it is under consideration. I can tell you from some of the informal conversations we've had, uh, uh, there are some very valuable um, suggestions that Hawaii have put forward. I, uh, I'm, if I continue to hear uh, them in, in these okay. listening okay. sessions, uh, hopefully we can mm -hmm. make, incorporate uh, some of those. But again, I can't make a determination right here from the from the microphone, but I think there's some, some really good suggestions that the organization put forward. I don't know if you Oh, I was just gonna add on your, I mean, we do have the entry, driver, entry level mm -hmm. driver training rule. We did negotiate a rule a couple years ago. It's not everyone, everything that everybody wants, but it's more than what we had before. So there is, that rule is in, in place now. It doesn't have a number of hours, it has a curriculum, you know, but it was a negotiated rulemaking uh, with all the interested parties that's kind of where it's at. Chuck has a question. Yeah, if I could make a statement in regards to engine level driver training, the same companies that thought ELD was going to be great for safety are the same companies that fought against engine level driver training for practically over 30 years. Uh, so what I want to say is that we're talking about the hours of service here. How is it that it's okay and at one time this past winter you drew a line from North Dakota When they are given the need for the farmers to have the Antarctic given and uh, you know hauled in the spring, they say, "Hey, you go to line five on your ELD, and just, you know you know when you need to rest. Just get the Antarctic hauled in." We have the same situation every time we have a hurricane. We say, "Hey, you know what? We got to get the supply, the gasoline, all like that. You know when you're tired. You know when you need to sleep." Uh, and evidently these people. Because you never hear, I mean, if you heard about a propane tank explosion, everybody in the country is going to hear about it because it's going to make the news. So, how is it that it's okay for these guys to go off the clock more or less 
companies that uh, thought ELD were great and they're the ones that oppose uh, entry uh, driver training. Uh, could you expand on that? Because I'm new and I, I'd like to know what you mean by that specifically. ATA, the Truck Load Carriers Association, all the big bank of carriers. <laughs> and just like that's the drive right now for autonomous trucks. They want to get rid of the driver of the truck because they don't want to pay them. And I mean, if you want to go to the pay and compensation level here, driver pay was adjusted for inflation from 1980 to what it is now. The uh, average driver wage would be around $80,000 a year instead of 50. Okay. I, I, I wanted to make sure I understood that. Uh, I mean, there's not a whole lot I can say about your question of the exemption other than the fact that those, those situations where the emergency exemptions are issued are a balancing act. At that point in time, we have to kind of balance the needs of the emergency situation, be it the being cold or whatever, along with the needs for safety and how that's handled. So they're, they're, we always have to make trade-offs in order to kind of really function as efficiently as we can. So I know understand that people have some different feelings about how those things work, but it's, it's a little bit more of a process than I think what it seems like uh, when you just see the exemption get issued on the outside. And just so I'm clear on that, um, that you know, we, we don't have the complete latitude to just grant exemption. We can only grant, we get our, whatever authority we have is, comes from Congress, and they tell us you can operate in this lane go outside of that lane, you have to come back to Congress. I think with those exemptions, that's, those are for emergent situations where there's weather emergencies or, or things like that. It's for a period of time. But, um, so those are different type of, of exemptions that are granted. Um, sir? Uh, yes. I understand that the are going to stay for a $2 million business more likely. But with our drivers that leave and go, we run through a lane all the time. And when they stop, they can't get back for pull off on a ramp for parking issues and they get ticketed. The Georgia charges about, if you're in the Rasmussen area right there, it's about $150 when you get Cox in the uh, uh, Georgia shut down most of their uh, rest areas. They're not there anymore. There's no funding from the government for it. What are you, what are you all planning on doing about that? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this, um, because this is a, you know, particularly the, the rest area or safe pullover area uh, issue. Um, it is related to something that you've, that's much bigger than our industry, your industry, and what we deal with. But it's the, the whole infrastructure in the United States, okay? Whether it's uh, the state of the highways, uh, the state of the railways, um, and that I think by anybody's assessment uh, have had a, a decline. The president has been very clear about this and has put his money where his mouth is. I think Congress and the president, this is one of those areas where they are I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, I can tell you from the FMCSA's perspective, we will use our, our position uh, and our relationship with your industry to say if we're going to have infrastructure investment in the country, here is what we are hearing from your industry, uh, and that is we need to, as part of the infrastructure improvement on the roadways, on the highways, is safe pullover areas, safe rest of areas. We can be an advocate uh, in that regard, along with the associations that you may or may not belong to, and if you don't belong to any of the, association, uh, the associations, then I would suggest you know your congressman and you know your senator, write it up. It doesn't have to be fancy. Just say, listen, the country's going to spend my tax dollars on infrastructure improvement. Here is something that will make the roads safer and make the, uh, the economy better. And that is, uh, you know, safe areas for us to, to pull over and be safe. So, does that help? I guess it does. <laughs> and maybe the parking is more of a safety issue yeah. than the ELD was. Yeah. They, might, they probably should have looked at parking before they put all those boxes on the truck. And says, okay, now find a place to park. Because it's pretty much, this is what we're going to do. Tech companies and stuff don't care. They're making millions of dollars off of it. We go and park. We try to get into parking. But they charge you what? 15, 16, 18 dollars, depending on what time of night to park at a truck stop now. You spend two hundred thousand dollars a year in fuel, you know, they don't care. It's all about their money. We're left sitting on the side of the road where people get hit, killed, you know, cars run in the back end of you. You can't go, you keep driving, you're gonna get trouble, and then there's your CSA points and stuff like that. To me, that's just a major safety issue that should be addressed. And it should have been addressed before the LPs were okay. Well, it, it
it is a little bit of, you know, what comes first, the, the chicken or the egg here, but I'm going to tell you that as we speak here today, the country is poised to spend a lot of your tax dollars on infrastructure improvement. And nobody knows better the uh, condition of the highways in the United States than the people in your industry. Uh, we are hoping, uh, and that's going to go to a lot of different areas if it goes through. One of the things that we will certainly be an advocate for is uh, areas, the, the issue that you've just raised. And uh, I'd be happy to partner with the associations or with uh, you folks to, uh, to, to make sure that that's a priority. Sir? I guess this is going to be directed more towards Mr. Lorenzo. I was at the ELE session here just a little while ago, and uh, somebody brought up the question, which was kind of the same thing I was thinking of asking at the time, was uh, with all of the exemptions and all of the confusion that this mandate has, has created for both the drivers and for law enforcement, what was, what's the point? You know, why, why can't we just stay on paper laws? Why, why was this necessary, uh, especially when you know, I think the proof's out there that there's not been an increase in safety. In fact, I see more dangerous driving by the carriers, a lot of carriers that have been on ELDs for years. A lot of people racing through parks, racing through truck stops, right. racing through towns, racing through construction zones, because they're all trying to beat the clock. But the, the, the question really was, you, uh, Mr. Lorenzo said something along the lines of you would, when asked what was the point, something about uh, you would argue that there was problems with paper, with running paper laws. I, I kind of wanted you to expand on that, what, where you, what, what do you believe the problems were? Why, why do we have to go to a trunk? What was wrong with, with running paper? Well, there's two issues that we were referenced in that session. First of all, the reason why we're doing ELDs, okay, is because Congress decided that ELDs were better than paper. Okay, that's the reason why. Congress passed the law. We're trying to implement the law. The discussion about the exemptions was about, you know, where we have flexibility to, and these are really exceptions, so regulatory exceptions from the rule, where we have flexibility to make it easier to implement. Um, then uh, that's kind of what we do. As opposed to when you look at electronic logs versus paper, I mean, I think we all have to be honest about this, and this is what the administrator started with. This is about hours of service. Everybody liked paper better because they didn't like the hours of service, right? I mean, so if you don't like the hours of service, you can kind of make the paper work the way you want. And you can't make the paper work, the, you can't make it work the way you want with the ELP. So I get that. And that's kind of why we're having this conversation now about hours of service. But for all those years, I think if we just kept going the way that we were, for all those years, you know, people were having concerns about the hours of service, but they weren't being raised. Some people were following them, some people weren't following them. I think now we've kind of collectively come to this discussion that says, hey, okay, how do we really, you know, move forward and go forward from here? But it's like I said, I mean, I, was, I, mean, I think we all know what I had more flexibility on my paper log means, right? So I think we just have to get to the point where the rules are working for all the groups that are out there and we can find a better way to kind of go forward. Yeah, and, if, and if I just want to emphasize that what we're talking about here. If ELDs force the issue forward to actually address the hours of service that improves that for you, then that's a good thing. Okay? Now, I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, but that's a necessary conversation that has to happen. So, that's where we are. And I'll agree, and, and, and people pretty much said, yes, it's, it's definitely an hours of service issue. There, there definitely needs to be some changes there. But what, what I'm, my, my train of thought is with these electronic logs, we have to have paper as a backup. And if the log goes down, doesn't boot up, whatever, see, I never had a paper log that didn't boot up in the morning. I didn't have a paper log that decided to log me out while I was driving down the road, which just happened to me the other day. I got stuck in stop and go traffic, and for whatever reason, that thing couldn't figure it out. That, and it logs me out, and then it sits there and beeps at me until I stop on the shoulder of the road somewhere and log back in. Or it says I have 
to run a paper log, but then it won't stop beeping at me until I stop and log back in. Am I supposed to stop on the side of the road? That's not really safe. Luckily, there was a place to pull over, a service plaza. I was able to stop and, and log back into it. Then I had to go back and fix it. I had to go in and edit. I spent more time pushing buttons and going and editing and putting in annotations than I ever did doing a paper log. And it, if, if we're worried about drivers cheating or, like you said, the, the flexibility, I think uh, one of the other gentlemen up here pretty much answered the question with the, the propane callers and the, the people that get exemptions when we have the, the bad weather. We, we know as professionals, we know when it's time to rest. And the, the anybody who knows yes. is going to find a way, whether they're on the electronic whether they're on paper. Electronics can be cheated too. There, you can put programs in, you, they can be cheated. People are gonna figure it out eventually with all these new systems. They're gonna figure out a way to cheat. And if somebody is determined, they're, they're gonna cheat. And they're, they're likely gonna cause a bad accident they're gonna get, and they're gonna get caught. And to me, it doesn't matter what they were running. You know, if, they, if they're that bad, then they, they deserve to get caught and they deserve to be caught. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I'm Blaine Celestine with Sovereign Roads, and I want to thank you guys for coming out. I also I want to thank these people here for doing what they do. You know, we thank our military, and I know many of you are, are retired military, maybe even active military. We thank them for their service. It's time to thank the American truck driver for his service, and we want to thank you for that. So, Now, you, you threw out a statistic earlier, and I just did some rough math. You said there was around 4,000 souls that were lost in, a, in a wrecks with big trucks. Uh, so I did some rough math on that. With 3.5 million trucks on the road and 30,000, you know, truck to car interactions a day on the interstate, you know, a car passing a truck or running alongside a truck. That's 105 billion interactions with one other soul every day. That's 38 trillion interactions. Now those lives are precious. Those are our family that's, that's in those cars. We realize that. But I don't really see the safety issue here. What I see is that these people need to be applauded. Okay, because there's, there's, that's a very, very low number, 4,000 people, as precious as it is, compared to how many people they are passing and running alongside on the road every day. The other thing is, there, there are people, we have a petition right now that we're circulating regarding drivers being able to be comfortable in the truck on their off periods. When their APU is not working or their bunk heater is not working, they don't have adequate air conditioning, how can an unrested driver be a safe driver? You know, this is a very serious issue, and none of us, we should not expect these people to go home or go, go home to their truck and not rest in the same conditions that we want to rest in our truck or rest in our homes every night before we go to work the next day. All right? It's been some excellent points here, and I really appreciate everybody. Thank you very much. I just want to say I agree with everything you said. Yeah, on the logbook thing, I have guys that have been driving 25 years. They're not rocket scientists. Some of them don't have a high school education. And now you want them to do tablets. They can't even have a smartphone. What am, what am I supposed to do with these guys that refuse to do it? They're going to quit. So when everybody quits and doesn't want to deal with technology, why is technology got to be shoved down a 50-year-old man's throat? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Well, I, you know, uh, technology, uh, I guess it's a very general question. I mean, technology marches on and we all have to adapt. I mean, I, I you know, I've got a, I've got a, a TV that I still haven't figured out. I've got a, a, a cell phone that I probably use about 20% of what its 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 uh, functionality is. 
Um, but when it comes to visitors, um, you know, it, it, what, I've, what I've also heard is that people, when they harness technology, they can be uh, work smarter and they can work safer. Yeah. Uh, so that's it. That's a, just a general response. It's not to the uh, to this. If you've got folks that you know uh, that uh, are not responding to. Well, he's not trans- smart. He, all he is is an employee in the business. He does not run the business. Mm-hmm. He's he's a cog in the wheel. He's an employee. You don't have people working on assembly lines to have to run the pattern. If a parts and things, I mean, you're asking a, a, a guy with a mediocre mentality. Not his fault. It makes fifty thousand dollars a year, contributes to his taxes, and now he doesn't want to work. So you know what's going to happen? He's going to quit trucking and work at a McDonald's for ten bucks an hour. I doubt that. Or he's going to go try and get disability or something. You know, you're pushing people out of the business that have done this for fifty years, like we're doing. I mean, yeah, maybe we're dinosaurs, but we're we're still getting the job done, and we need we need some respect. Uh, and I, I don't know, you know, what I, I, I've had to go through technology changes. I mean, look, I don't have the, the high, when I was commissioner in New York and New Jersey, I had uh, organizations of 3,000 people uh, who were not the highest paid state employees or the highest trained state employees, and we had to introduce technologies that they, it took some time, and frankly, some people didn't pick up on these. The people that work for you and you're in the in the motor vehicle offices, uh, and I think that th- it happens in the private sector as well. Whether it's something that government is, you know, implementing, or whether it's just because this is what the market, uh, how it's changing, uh, and that's just the general uh, response. I understand what you're saying. Uh, I just don't, you know, I don't have a, a magic wand to say that. Uh, we're going to stop, you know, technology implementation in this particular industry. You're going to see, in all different areas, you're going to see, uh, you know, developments in technology that we didn't have five years ago or ten years ago. And uh, uh, it maybe it's, that's a way of kind of leading into the automated vehicle thing. You know, I'm, I know that there's, uh, you know, I don't see automated vehicles on our roadways, you know, going, you uh, you know, next year uh, are competing with you. But that type of technology is already incorporated in those trucks uh, out there. It's probably incorporated in, in the trucks that, that you drive today that you know wasn't there 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And when you go to buy a brand new truck, if, you, if you're lucky enough to do that, you're gonna invest in the one with all the bells and whistles that you, that you believe are there and the person if you own that truck and you put somebody behind the wheel of that truck you're going to say well, what person I want behind the wheel of that truck has got to learn that because you're making a major investment uh, you yeah. know so anyway that's that's my that's my yes right there, so back in the back. My, my problem with some of this is one hours of service if we had really flexibility and hours of service because there's times you're stuck in traffic and all your ELD is going tick, 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 tick. You've run out of hours in the middle of the freeway. What do you want us to do? Pop the brakes and cross our arms and tell officer, I'm out of hours, I can't move. What do you want us to do? We're in between exits. If we have flexibility and hours of service, all right, maybe, maybe I've had my 10 hours off and I go two hours into my shift. Traffic is up the evening and I want to get off and take a break. Why can't I stop my clock, take my couple hour break, maybe I'm tired, maybe I need a nap, maybe I all of a sudden got starting to get sick. We need flexibility and hours of service and then maybe, just maybe, these ELDs will work. Why I'm totally against the ELDs is because the way they went about it. When the mega carriers want to put the on
Amen. These people are running like a bat out of hell to beat the clock. Don't tell me how safe they are. Tell right. me how safe these are going to be. When we can't stop when we're tired, we have to drive when we're tired. Really?
All right, right Charles. Hi, Mr. Walsh. Mr. Martinez, first of all, my name is Charlie Claver, and I've been a professional truck driver for 26 years. I had zero accidents, zero tickets, zero violations. I currently run a paper wall. As of today, I'm still on a paper wall because it allows me to get home safely to my family. When you hear comments like that woman made back there, these are the facts that are made. In the interim, while you try to sort out the problem, there are some of us that are gonna fall victim to the mandate. The mandate started out horribly when they started giving exemptions to everybody but the majority of the people in this room. They say 96% of us are compliant. So what is the reason for all the exemptions that the big carriers get and the ag industry gets, if 96, according to your office, is what's compliant as of right now, please tell everyone in this room why you guys are picking winners and losers with exemptions. So th th this is the question. What exemptions are you talking about? Egg haulers. Okay, the, the egg haulers. Pick one. U.S. Express got one to allow people to do this. UPS got one for that. Okay. Uh, and just go down. You know and you're sitting there. I mean, don't pretend like you don't know. Well, let me, let me, why don't you let me explain? And then well, you asked. I, why I, exemptions? Well, okay, <coughs> now that I know what you're talking about, I can answer your question. Because what you have there, the, it wasn't U.S. Express, but whatever, UPS and those exemptions that were issued, okay, were not an exemption from not having an ELD. All those drivers are required to have an ELD, period. Okay, those exemptions were for some very specific technical issues. Okay, so the only exemption, there, there are two things out there that require, that have folks that do not have to have an ELD. That's the ag waiver. Okay, so that's out there. There's been a lot of issues that have come up. You can agree or disagree, but that's kind of where we are with the whole transport, transportation of livestock being very different than other freight. Right, wrong, or different, that's where we are with that. The only other exemption that's been issued for people that don't have to have DOD is a very small exemption to a very complicated most picture industry. Everybody else that's out there is required to have DOD. There's no other exemptions. From anybody else. 99 and older, your trucks have an exemption. 2000 and older, Man. don't. So a 99 right. truck is safer than a 2018. So, so if we had required that <coughs> to happen, then we would have gotten free for that, right? Same but, truck, but, but it would be everybody then. This is but not about safety. Yeah, if it's, it's all safety, put every truck on it. That's the whole thing. You're, you are picking winners and losers as the government. Okay, so the rule, the, a couple of things to think about here, and I, I, I understand that and I've heard of this before. Um, so when the rule was getting up, and it goes through this process, yes. right, and everybody gets a chance to comment, and we kind of have to balance the comments. We are required, when we do a rule, by law, to consider not only the safety aspects of it, but we're required to consider the cost side of it. And sometimes that's a balancing act. So... The issue with the pre-2000s was, you know, if we had required that, everybody would have said it was too costly, okay, because those trucks aren't equipped the money. same way. It's all about money. So we don't require it, and we get criticized for it. So it's kind of a lose-lose situation for us here to try and kind of balance that. Because we're, we're, remember, when we're doing the rule, we're doing it because Congress already passed a law. We're just trying to pass the regulations that's exactly Who what recommended we want to hear. What you're telling us, I want to be very clear because you are the administrator. Mm -hmm. I met with Mr. Mattis when he was the administrator, so I know how this is going. You're telling us Congress. our Congress, our elected representatives, can intervene to help you fix this problem and not have it take two years if they do their job. That's what you're telling us. Uh, I don't. I I don't know how long if they. If, Never, never mind, sir. That's okay. I understand. Your position. Up. Who has the ultimate authority to help you fix this problem now and not two years from now? Uh, well, frankly, you have the ability to help me do regulation change if that's what we want. And regu what, I've, what I said before is regulation change that gives you more flexibility may actually be quicker and may actually happen as opposed to going to Congress, because Congress may not be able to get it done. I don't know how long you know, it 
talking about when we're talking about an hours of service change that allows flexibility, allows you not to have Pat and Mad and every other organization saying that you're favoring this industry and patent it. How long are we talking? Because some of us in these small companies, mm -hmm. we can't afford the ELD, we can't afford the equipment, we can't afford the lost productivity. Because face it, you know the issues, we're not going to go into them. Loading, unloading, it robs a guy of the amount of time he has to make money to feed his family and support his business. We need something sooner than yesterday. This needs to happen soon. If it's regulatory, tell us, tell us in this room, we'll help you do it. We need a change in the hours of service. We can't wait for it to come. It needs to happen expeditiously. Or we're going to lose our business. I want to have to drive the truck with us to see what we have to go through out here and the roads and the shippers and everything else. They should drive with us before they make it. Yes. Yes. I don't Not the ADA. I can't change Congress. And what I'm telling you is, you know, I don't make laws. What's directly in my wheelhouse is regulation change. And you, what you, you have is, I'm here to tell you that if I can narrow down onto paper some reasonable changes that doesn't exceed our authority under, that Congress has given us, we can make some changes. Okay, and I'm not going to give you a timing. I'm just telling you, regulations do take time. Well, the problem is, is the timing when small companies are going to go out of business. I, 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 hear, I hear what you're saying. More people are going to die. There's a lot of stress. Okay. okay, hold on just a second. We've only got 30 minutes left, and I want to make sure all these people that have had their hands raised that want to speak get their opportunity to speak. So, is it okay if we move on from that point? Yeah, I'm just going to close it out just by saying something that the administrator said earlier, which is it was only just in the last couple of months that we got an actual petition for a change in the rule. So, that's, we can, that's what it takes to get things started.
um, should have been addressed first instead of, okay, throwing it out there, all this crazy stuff happening, everybody's in chaos, and then, okay, now we're going to go back and try to fix it and try to, you know, mend it up now. Do you feel like maybe um, instead of throwing it out there, maybe we should have put everything on the table and then wrote it out? Amen. I just want to honestly answer we, Yeah, we don't, you know, we don't operate in a, uh, you know, in a perfect world, obviously. When, when a law gets passed, we get a certain amount of time that uh, where there's a mandate that uh, says, and you will do this, you know, in such and such time. I'm not sure what the, what the time frame was before I, I was here, obviously. Um, but, uh, and that, whatever the timeline is, that is what we have to comply with. And sometimes a shorter timeline creates, uh, uh, does create uh, confusion. Um, but uh, I'll say that, you know, that's, that's kind of what we're trying to do. We, if we've gotten to a point where a large portion of the, uh, of the, uh, of our stakeholders are in compliance, what can we do to that other, uh, to, to get that other uh, portion that's not in compliance, but then also, Did you how can we improve the environment? Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what we're getting here is, mm -hmm. is uh, there's, there's, we're going to get to a point where we're actually addressing some fu more fundamental issues, more fundamental issues than I have an ELD or I don't have an ELD and it was mandated by Congress. There's some more fundamental issues here that will improve um, your, uh, the, the landscape. Do you guys understand that while you guys are trying to improve that, that people's lives can be affected in the meantime, people can go out of business, and um, do, do you realize that, does that mean anything to you guys that the effect that it can have on these people's livelihoods while the twerks and the tweaks are being um, implemented? Again, we're, we have a mandate from Congress to get this done, and uh, that's what we're trying to do, and it's an ongoing process, and, and also, as I said, besides the ELD, if you, we, one, one of the process that is on kind of the back end here is that it was not part of ELD, is what are the issues that are more fundamental that we can change? And that's when we do, when we have a, a here, this session tomorrow in hours of service, forget about ELDs for the moment, okay? When you go to that session tomorrow, let's talk about hours of service and what we can, how we can change it to make more sense for you, because that's something that I may be able to, to, to help, okay? Without changing the law. I can't change law, but I may be able to change regulation. And that's where we can start. Start hours of service, law or mm -hmm. regulation? Pardon me? Hours of service, is that a law or regulation? The hours themselves are a regulation. That is within our ability to change. That's why somebody brought that up earlier. In 2005, right, whatever happened, we went to the 14-hour rule. That was a, that was a regulation. Congress sometimes gets involved; they change part of it. But in terms of, you know, if the question is basically, could we as an agency change the 14-hour rule? The answer is, if you go through the process that's prescribed by law, yes, we can change that rule. How long would it take you if you met with us and sat down? We all, as a coalition, agreed. If you had ATA, OIDA, and we'll say 75,000 owner operators on Facebook all agreed, let's work on this. How long would it take? That's what we want. That's kind of what we're waiting for. If you get ATA, OIDA, and a group of owner operators to agree, how long would it take you guys to sit down and say, okay, here's the new reg? There's, there is a, so there's a formal process. That's that what we, we want to know. Again, we don't control it's made up. Every, every agency. You just, you just said you guys sure. make the rates. Yeah. Right. You just said you made the rates. So how long? Came to you. How long? Let, let me explain it really quickly. So, yes, we can make the rates. Yes. The Congress passed the Administrative Procedures Act. The Bureau of Tech, okay, that's how you make a rate. Okay. Yep. Okay. And, and in FMCSA in particular, there's a three step process that has to be followed. Three public notices that have to be followed by that rule for it to be done. If everybody agreed on it, sure, it would go faster. If we started it today, as the administrator said, it's still going to take two or three years. Why? Because that's how long the process takes. Because you have to publish a notice, you have to take comment on it, you have to do analysis, because the Administrative Procedures Act requires 
all kinds of cost benefit analysis and technical pieces that have to be done that take a really long time. That's what the rulemaking process is. We don't control that either. We have to follow it. But if you went back to the old 10 and 8 hour rule, you don't have to do a sleep study. That was in series for years. You know, all you have to do is go back to something like that. You just eliminated that study group. And as far as open comment periods, if ATA, OIDA, and another coalition agrees, where are the comments? Hey, in a scenario where everybody agreed on something, it definitely goes faster. No question. Turn your freaking tracks off. That's what it's going to take.
one thing gets done to make anyone safer. Represent the owner operators. They pay their way through life. Mm -hmm. I know we're not doing EOD, but if the unlikely like puts you on duty driving when you move, why can't, if, it, if you sit for more than a minute, you take you off duty, knows that the truck ain't being moved, and it can take you off duty and not waste your hours. Like if you're sitting there, why can't it just stop? And so you get paid on driving, you know. I mean, the ELDs actually do that, but the point is, is that that's not an ELD issue. That's the hours of service rules say you're on duty and you're driving during that period of time while you're stuck in traffic. What the ELD does is not really going to help you with that particular situation. Well, I mean, if you're in a bad accident, if you're on a, on a stop freeway for 30 minutes, you're not in control of that truck. You're stuck. Understood. And there's that actually, and we're going to talk about this tomorrow, because a lot of people don't realize that there is a provision in the rule that allows you two extra hours of driving when something like that happens. I do have a safety, one safety concern that was brought up to me. You've got all these drivers running ELDs now, okay?
okay? Everybody knows where we're at. My neighbor said, all right, my wife is home alone. The dispatcher knows I'm in Florida. My wife is home because now my truck can be tracked. I might not get along with that dispatcher. He knows I'm gone. He knows I'm away from town. My wife is home alone. You know, that's the thing we're all going through. We don't ride with our wives. Our significant others are home, but now because you've made it that we're all tracked and everybody we work with knows where we are at any given time, we're leaving our wife and our family home alone. Now everybody knows. That is a big safety concern. That's one that wasn't brought up here. And I hear that all the time. You know, you want to track me when I'm under a load, fine. But I pay my insurance, I pay my plate. You guys don't have the right to track me when I'm empty. <laughs> I am, that's my truck, that's my house. You know, and everybody knows where we're at. It is a big safety concern for everybody at home. Why have Think on that. Choice. Choice. Have you guys started any studies on what this is doing to the trucking industry in regards to what it's costing the company? What I mean by that is our shippers and receivers that we're going to now, they're seeing this as a big cash cow. Um, if you're late, if you have an appointment, you're late an hour, they want to take $150 off your rate. Or they want to take $300 off your rate. Or they want to take and drop your appointment for that day and then schedule you the next day for an appointment. Because the ELDs had stopped you the night before because you couldn't make enough miles. Um, Another thing that's happening, the truck stops, all the parking spots are going to pay parking now because they know you guys are forcing us into the truck stops. The cities around all of these industrial areas are creating laws where you can't park your trucks there. Because a lot of my fleet has had started trying to park closer to the shippers and the receivers so that you know they can make their appointments. Signs are going up everywhere. You can't park here, you can't park here. The tickets. I've had a huge increase in um, not paying any attention to any of my drivers. I mean, that's gone almost away. All of the, the fees for being late for changing appointments, Walmart's acting crazy like no other. If you miss one of their appointments, they charge you a late fee, and then they might schedule you two days late because you can't get in there. Um, my drivers can't stop and sleep because they're scared of losing their job because there's been a late fee last week, a late fee this week, a late fee next week possible. I mean, where are you guys studying and looking at those results and what's going on afterwards? Well, I mean, we are doing some work on that, but some of the things you brought up, I think, are definitely worth following up on. What, we're, what we have been doing is we've been doing some work on this whole detention time issue to try and really understand it, figure out how, you know, what is really happening there, trying to get some input into that. But I think the other suggestions you brought up are things that maybe we should be looking at as well. So I appreciate that. My, my drivers are being coerced and forced to be driving. I mean, that that's what it is. They're, they're being forced to drive it. It's costing them money. And I mean, if I've got a guy that, that you know, he's late, 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 who, who puts the bill to pay for the missed appointments? Um, and, and I'll tell you, have to drive faster. They're more reckless when they when they're in a hurry because they're looking at a three hundred dollar late fee for this appointment. I mean, mm -hmm. how do you do it? I mean, it is, it, <coughs> there's a, there's a lot of consequences. And I'm wondering, are you guys looking at this? Can you change it? Um, I think those are some great great points. And uh, uh, <coughs> as you said at least one area we are definitely looking at it. But some of those are first impressions. Where I hadn't uh, heard some of those. You know. Unintended consequences. Uh, uh, well, they're, they're I think it's worth the money. Yeah. They're, they're definitely seeing the money in, in our ability to not get to the shippers and receivers. Thank you. Uh, we'll take one more question. Anybody who has not asked a question, I have. Sir, a question? Right there. That's you. Yes, sir. I've been in this business for 47 years. It seems
take off any time in that 24 hour period. And then you come along and you put a 14 hour window in. And I think everybody in this room will agree with me that that 14 hour window is ruining the trucking industry. We've got it. That concludes our FMCSA little meeting. Um, I tried to bring you into what we were dealing with and getting to see today. I hope you enjoyed it. I uh, hope you got to hear everything all right. I'm not sure how it was, being that I was the one keeping it. <laughs> anyway, I will catch you guys later. And Chuck Biddles, I'm going to see if I can change it so you can share it. I don't know why it's not letting you share it, buddy. But uh, anyway, i to go look at more stuff here at the uh, Matt's truck show. So I will catch y'all later.